Well, welcome. This is our first ever alumni awards convening. It is a great opportunity to have a party and to say thank you to and honor very important people. Uh, so my name is Dan Schwartz. I am the new dean here. Uh, well, I've actually been a professor here for 15 years, and so I've had a chance to see many great students and faculty, and so it's very exciting to have everyone here. This event is particularly in honor of Carla, Helen, and Jonathan, and so we will get to hear great things about them and from them. Uh, but before we do that, <clears throat> I need to point out how this came about. It began in March 2014 to do this, and it took them 18 months to develop their plan. So this is, even though it's going to be over in like 40 minutes, <laughs> you can imagine, it's a lot of time. And uh, so they had to set the criteria for the award, and they solicited nominations. And uh, this is, this is non-trivial because there, we have 23 doctoral programs, seven masters, three joint programs, and all these people should be eligible for an alumni award. Uh, so I would like to thank uh, Angela and David Philo and the Yellow Chair Foundation because they, they were champions of this idea and they helped support it. Uh, they, are, they are very committed to helping underserved youth and so they've been great friends to the school and great friends to this, this particular event. The way this is going to work is we're going to have important people uh, present important people, which is a, which is a good model. So uh, we're going to invite our own Ann Lieberman to introduce the first re recipient, Jonathan Jansen. Uh, so Ann was, is a senior scholar here at the Graduate School of Education, previously, previously known as Susie, in case you missed that name. Uh, and she has known Jonathan since 2004. They met in South Africa at the University of Pretoria, uh, where Jonathan was the first black dean at historically white university. An amazing accomplishment. They were supposed to be rethinking leadership, but they didn't just do that. They also became fast friends and devoted colleagues. So, Anne, thank you. I've been in education for over 40 years, and I have to say I have never met anybody with the kind of talent that Jonathan has. He's going to kill me for saying this, but it's true. He has led a leadership life in trying to change the university, in, in particular in Pretoria, uh, in post-apartheid uh, South Africa. He's a teacher, he's a leader, he's a researcher, and he's a writer. But the best thing about him is that he's got the ability to somehow step back and describe the kind of entanglements, as he calls them, that happens with students and faculty uh, when they try to deal with questions of race, culture, relationships, and politics, which is the way he has been involved for 14 years. I have to say that he's also an incredible humanist and also with incredible humility. He will tell you he doesn't know anything, but he's lying. He knows a, he knows a lot. Uh, and I have to say that one of the things about him is that he's He's learned, like most, nobody else I know, how to lead, teach, act on what he sees and does as a leader, um, and somehow figure out how to step back and talk about it and share it with us, with two great books and another one on the way. He has worked in the toughest area that we know, and that is the quest for equity in higher education, and in the world. Name me somebody who's done the kind of work that Jonathan has done. Thank you. Come on, Jonathan. Thank you. Well, I still think you made a mistake. <laughs> because in uh, the four years that I spent here walking between Kabali and uh, this building, I met some amazing students from all over the world. In fact, I see some of them here this evening. And I think they deserve this award. So I'm waiting that when you open the envelope or whatever you give, that you're going to say, oops, you know, uh, we did make a mistake. But I'm grateful to be here. And I'm incredibly grateful to uh, my dean at the time, uh, Mike Atkin. I haven't seen him here for 
writing the nomination. Uh, I am very, very grateful to the school and the new dean, uh, who looks far too young for my liking. <laughs> um, and, uh, uh, and I am deeply, deeply grateful to my professors who were absolutely outstanding. And I see them here. Uh, um, Martin isn't here, Chicky, uh, Hans Weiler, uh, and others. Thank you so much, uh, Joel Sammer for making such an incredible difference uh, in, in my life. Now, wherever I go uh, in South Africa and also in other parts of the world, people ask me one question. What is it about Stanford University, and in particular the School of Education, that makes it such an incredible place for scholarship uh, and that produces such amazing students? So I thought about that question over the two decades since I left, and I want to tell you why you're so good. Okay, you can take out your pen now and make notes. <laughs> this is what you do. I figured it out. You put in one room really, really smart professors with really, really smart students. And then the smart professors tell the smart students how smart they are every single day. <laughs> but you see, if that's the only thing that you did, you wouldn't get very far. Because you also have to create the opportunities, the networks, the speaking engagements in order for that person, because otherwise it's just a pep talk, in order for that person to live out their talent. So I wouldn't be here this evening if Hans Weiler didn't once tell me, I don't know if you remember Hans, I want you to go with me to CIES at uh, Harvard University that year and share a paper with me on education uh, policy as legitimation. And they slotted us in for a Sunday morning, and three people showed up, Hans, myself, <laughs> and the photographer. And it was, you know, uh, 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 you know, this is amazing. It scared the hell out of me because, as you know, Hans, I mean, he's lightened up a little bit, you know, uh, you know since. But he was a very austere, you know, sort of, uh, you know, you, you, you got scared. He was a bloody good professor, but, you know. And he is asking this kid from Cape Town in South Africa to go with him to present at CIES at Harvard. Oh, Lord, I didn't sleep that night. I wouldn't be here if Joel Samoff didn't say, I want you to do a, a, a literature review on decentralization for Swedish cedar. That scared the hell out of me, you know. Uh, and so to work with Joel. If Martin didn't say, and you know Martin is always last minute, you know Martin. <laughs> Jonathan, next week I've got some policymakers coming here from Malaysia and Indonesia. I want you to teach a course on curriculum policy. I say, are you nuts? <laughs> you know? And of course you just have to show up and deliver. But though, I, w I wouldn't be here if a young man from Senegal, Bakari Diame, didn't say to me, listen, I'm sick and tired of being the president of the Stanford African Students Association. I'd like you to be the next president, <laughs> you know, uh, and so on and so forth. What I'm trying to say is, and I'm so sorry to disappoint my professors, if you think the Stanford students become smart because of your causes and your modules, I'd like to say that's not true. They become smart because they know you, and you connect them, and you believe in them, and that's huge. But you see, when I came here, it was in the very dark days of apartheid in South Africa, and I was really angry. And I say this, and I'm deeply embarrassed about it, and I always say, apologize for this when I'm at home in South Africa, but I hated white people because of the stuff that happened to us. And this is where I learned that your life is enriched when the people around you don't look like you, or pray like you, or make love like you, or come from where you come that you are a much better person. And so I confess, there were one or two meetings that I disrupted. <laughs> but I learned here that reason is better than rage, and that organizing is better than complaining. And so for all these gifts, I thank you.
Jonathan, from all of us. It's a, it's a great honor. Congratulations. Thank you, my brother. So now uh, it's my pleasure to introduce Amy Riley, who's a STEP alumna and has known Helen since 2001. Uh, I believe they met when Eastside Preparatory had just graduated its second class and was expanding its freshman enrollment to 40 students. So the way they know each other is that Amy and Helen have a passion for the mission of Eastside and a deep love of books and reading, and this bound their friendship together. In her nomination, Amy said, Helen is the necessary glue that binds together our school community in the tumultuous journey towards social change. We think that Helen would want this group to know that Amy is part of that glue too. So Amy, you're next. Because I'm an English teacher, I want to begin with a story. Uh, Three Questions by Leo Tolstoy is a story about a king who searches for answers to what he feels are the three most important questions for success. What is the right time to begin in every, everything? Who are the right people to listen to? And what is the most important thing to do? The king, through a very trying experience, discovered the answers to be the most important time is now, the most impor important person is whoever you are with, and the most important thing is to do good by that person. Helen Kim exemplifies this model of success as an agent for social change. Since receiving her bachelor's degree from Stanford and her master's from the STEP program, she has spent over 20 years working in high school education, from high school teacher to department chair to co-founder and vice principal of Eastside College Preparatory School. She is a mentor and friend to each student and each teacher who walks through her door. Social change for Helen begins and ends with inspiring, teaching, and sometimes cajoling young people to find the best in themselves, even in the face of considerable challenges. Whatever a student is facing, Helen becomes immersed in le the learning required to become that child's best advocate, whether it means sitting down to listen to a struggling reader summarize a difficult text, teaching how to solve for X, again, or navigating the mental health or foster care system with a child in crisis. And the result is, of all her accolades, the most important is the happiness and appreciation of the parents whose children she has helped to guide into adulthood and the successes of those students in their chosen paths. In accepting this award, she is once again doing good by those she is with, shining light on the successes of Eastside. She is a constant reminder to her students that they too can choo do and choose to do good in the world by making decisions about their lives in the present, by listening closely to those around them, and by doing good for all those they meet, something that so many of them do once they leave our campus. Thank you, Helen, for your leadership, your unflagging commitment to students who are underserved, and your kindness in allowing us this one moment to show our deep appreciation for all that you do to improve the lives of young people. Thanks, Amy. Um, it is an honor um, to be receiving this inaugural GSE Award for alums, especially in recognition for all the work that we've done at Eastside School. Um, this award coincides with Eastside's 20th year, so this milestone has given us lots of opportunity to reflect, reflect on where we've been, how far we've come, and all the work that we have left to do. Um, when we started Eastside in 1996 with eight students and borrowed spaces around East Palo Alto, our goal was to provide a college prep curriculum to prepare our students to be successful in four-year colleges. And it was a rough start. Um, we started on a park bench. We moved around to borrowed spaces in the Whiskey Gulch area of East Palo Alto. And at the end of the first semester in December, our, st our students were still asking us, so Helen, where are we going to have classes when we get back from break? And um, all I could answer was, well, well, we'll see. And morale was low. But the students and the parents, they stuck with us. The me of 1996 could not even have imagined or hoped for what Eastside has become today. So 20 years later, there are moments when I stand alone in the middle of the open quad in the middle of the day, 
and there's not a single student in sight. All of our students are in the classroom discussing, thinking, reading, writing. And I am in awe. It is a magical, it's a magical place and it's a magical feeling. Um, I have a sense of awe for the tireless work and the effort that our teachers and students put in every day. I have a deep gratitude for the supporters of the school. And I have a deep gratitude for the, for the first set of students who really had not much reason to, um, to put their faith in a school that we are planning to build and grow. So at the east side of today, we have a lot of visitors coming through our school. So some want to observe classroom instruction, some want to learn about rigorous college prep curriculum, some want to learn about the structures that we use to support our students' success. And when they come, we ask them about feedback from their visit. Um, and the comment that visitors make most often is that there's something special about this place, something palpable, a sense of purpose and um, a real intellectual engagement. The other thing that visitors note is that our students are really happy. So the question is, what makes all this possible? My answer is, it's the high quality of the teachers who do the daily work, who have those um, who have those meaningful interactions with the students every day. And more importantly, our high quality teachers, they stay. <laughs> so that's probably the thing that I am most proud of, that we've created a school where, students, where all the teachers, they want to stay and they want to teach. And that has been such a critical factor to our success. So teachers stay and each year they build on and enrich and rework their curriculum based on the successes and failures of the previous year or the, or the needs of the new class. Our teachers stay and each year they become even better teachers and they share with each other their thoughtful reflections about their practice. Our teachers stay and they help perpetuate this um, steady culture of high expectations. And it is this school culture that makes such a difference in the academic success of our students in high school and beyond. Um, so last year, when we were going through the WASP process, we surveyed all of our students about their perceptions of the academic work that they do at this school. And the students wrote comments like, at Eastside, we are pushed to embrace challenges. At Eastside, we have to take academic risks. And at Eastside, we support each other's successes. And the strength of their high school experience is so connected to the strength and reliability and stability of our faculty. The task of learning how to, how to figure out derivatives or, or figure out the products of a chemical reaction while in the throes of the anxieties that come with adolescence, that's challenging. The steadiness and the consistency of the learning experience that our faculty provide lowers the social and emotional barriers to learning. So in our school culture, students can just lower their guard and, and just learn. And particularly for the students um, who have less stability in the other parts of their lives, whether it's from risks that come from their community or uncertainty of their home lives, this steadiness of expectations takes on an even greater importance in their learning environment. So it is within this academic culture that expects students to be engaged intellectuals that our students grow and they transform and it's amazing. And each time it happens, we're not at all certain which individual conversations, messages, classroom moments that made the difference. But the strength of the school culture is like this, this like current that keeps students moving in the right direction, even while they're still trying to figure out who and how they want to be. That current gives them room to make mistakes that are the byproducts of adolescence. And even in those moments when they make mistakes, they're still, like, they're still swept forward by this cultural current, what our students describe through statements like, at Eastside, we're scholars. And this culture building is ongoing. We see, whenever we see cracks in that culture, we're intentional, purposeful, and thoughtful in our response. We praise risk taking and making mistakes, and we applaud effort and self-reflection, and, and we try to recognize persistence and growth and, and when students support each other. And all of that just makes the culture stronger. 
and this is what our teachers do at our school. They do all of this work, and they do it all in addition to teaching the content knowledge and planning all their meaningful instruction. So as a recipient of this award through the Graduate School of Education, I am honored that I get to talk about the success of Eastside as a reflection of the work of our teachers. As educators, we, we get to work with adolescents, and we have the rare gift of witnessing the transformative development of individuals. And sometimes that transformation over, occurs over a course of a, a year, but more often it happens over many, many years. And it's often the ones who had the bumpiest road or the more, the, all those detours to, to and through college who in the end inspires us the most. They're the ones who, while we're in it, we're thinking, I am not making any difference at all. And years after their graduation, when they come back, to tell you, they tell you, your message has meant so much to me. So in conclusion, I want to acknowledge that this business of teaching is really hard. It's complex and it's humbling. And um, even with the successes that we've had at Eastside, it's still a work in progress. And there's so much stuff to figure out. Um, but at the end of the day, I can't imagine anything else I'd rather be doing. So I want to thank the School of Education for honoring me and all of the work of all of the teachers at Eastside. Thank you. On behalf of the Graduate School of Education, congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. So it's a pretty amazing story of growth on so many different timescales, teachers, students, schools, cultures. It's really, it's really heartening. Uh, next, we have asked Dr. Kelly Skeff to introduce the third and final recipient, Dr. Carla Pugh. Uh, Dr. Skeff and Dr. Pugh met in 1997, and they have two things in common. I'll give you a second to guess one of them. Uh, both are physicians. Dr. Skeff is a leader and teacher in internal medicine, and Dr. Pugh is in the surgical field. Second guess, they are both graduates from the Stanford Graduate School of Education. Uh, they have used their training in education to improve education and the training of physicians, and to connect the science of education with the science of medicine. And so the goal is to improve healthcare in the United States. Uh, we also think it's remarkable that Dr. Skeff is the first medical doctor to earn his degree from the GSE. Not, not his medical degree, mind you. It's, <laughs> although Martin has more talents than you know. Uh, and that Dr. Pugh is the second to receive her PhD. What a treat it is to be back home. Um, I walked into Nathan Gage's office in 1977. How many of you know Nathan Gage? That's right, about 10. <laughs> so it was a while ago, but I want to uh, tell you that it is so much fun to be back on campus and uh, just walk over. And I thank the dean and the committee for doing this award. Uh, and the opportunity to return home f to, with, to be with you. Uh, the honor for Dr. Pugh is meaningful to me for a lot of reasons. Uh, in giving this award to her, we're celebrating the influence of a graduate of this school, the Stanford Graduate School of Education, on the health of the population. And not everybody may think about the fact that you, with individual graduates that come out of this place, began to influence large cadres of people over and over. In addition, it's meaningful to me to revisit you all because I just left a seminar at the medical school tonight, a seminar that's going on in the 30th year of our program of the Stanford <coughs> Faculty Development Program for Medical Teachers, a teaching improvement program that is in over 60% of the U.S. medical schools. So this is our 30th year of this, and I think we're just getting started, okay. The excitement of having faculty who are in higher education see the utility of learning about the science of education to improve their teaching skills is an unusual concept. Higher education faculty don't, in usual 
circumstances seek out teaching improvement skills as something that would help them. And yet we've been quite gratified that the field of medicine, after 40 years of working on this, has represented a group of people who have now opened up to examine what they're doing in teaching and how that's influencing the practice of medicine. So we're very proud of that. So walking into Saris, it was a really exciting thing because I remember, I think, this program had its embryology somewhere between here and Coverly. Okay. But prior to, describe, to discussing the recipient of this award, I want to highlight that an award for an alumnus is an award for many people. First, this is an award for Dr. Pugh's family. <laughs> Always true. Family who supported her interest as a child and supported her throughout education. Uh, part of my role in the medical school was to be the program director for all the residents who were specializing in internal medicine, and I did that for 20 years. And one of the things that I did for 20 years was take credit for all the work that the parents had done <laughs> before the people got to me. Well, so we want to know that. We're Second, this is an award for Dr. Pugh's mentors in medicine, mentors from Howard and mentors from Stanford, who had the wisdom and insight to recognize that she would benefit from formal involvement in the study of the process of teaching and learning. Third is an award for Stanford itself as an institution whose faculty revel in the opportunity to recognize and support the growth of an individual with unique abilities, as you spoke about them. A theme that has led me to call Stanford one of the outstanding mentoring institutions. A mentoring institution that identifies the nugget inside the individual and then wraps the institution around the nugget and the, and the nugget grows. That is Stanford. And finally, it's not only an award for Dr. Pugh, but it's an award for this school, the Graduate School of Education at Stanford. Because that school, as a school that once again has provided what I want to call an invitation to learn. As I went in to see Nathan Gage, he invited me to take a class. He invited me to learn about the science of education. He invited me to see an area that was not recognized by many people on campus as how many things were going on in this building. So this is an award for a school that welcomed another professional in order to assist that individual to understand and to integrate two noble fields, the field of education and the field of medicine, to develop innovations that would ultimately improve the health of mankind. So everyone here should feel proud of this award because you all had something to do with it. But here today, <laughs> yes, you all deserve a hand. <laughs> but we're here today to celebrate how all those forces have resulted in a wonderful individual and graduate of this institution, Dr. Carla Pugh. And in introducing Carla, I've chosen not to list her accolades of national, national renown, but rather to simply highlight a few of her wonderful characteristics that have led to today's recognition, characteristics such as the following. Her gentility and quickness to smile, enabling her to make all of us happy to be wherever she is. Her commitment to help others, including helping teddy bears with Band-Aids, am I right? Even as a child. Her curiosity to be intrigued by the complex process of learning and skill development. And as was just described, the process of teaching and learning and skill development is a complex process. Her intellectual capability to recognize challenges in the practice of medicine. Her professional honesty to not only see but also highlight a gap in the performance of healthcare providers and her insight to identify and to address a core skill to address that gap in performance. Her personality and her collaborative nature to bring together teams of educators, scientists, and engineers 
to address this problem. And finally, her work ethic, working tirelessly to develop approaches to better assess and enhance a crucial ability of the hands of a surgeon, the ability to feel, and in so doing, improving the health of the public. So it is with great pleasure and honor that I introduce my colleague in the fields of both education and medicine, Dr. Carla Pugh. Celebrations are a wonderful thing. Kelly, thank you for being here. Thank you for your very kind introduction. And thank you for having the courage to honor your passion. The bond we share in striving for excellence in medical education continues to guide me and continues to inspire me. I have to share a story with you. I started out several years ago with a grand and unassuming plan to make great changes in medical and surgical education. And I had no fear. I had no fear because I was a surgery resident. And surgical residents are invincible, strong leaders who can do anything with very little sleep and their hands tied behind their backs. <laughs> Having said that, even as a superhero with the full backdrop of magical powers, I knew I needed the right tools to succeed. I wanted to complete my goal with the highest integrity and the highest standards possible. I also knew I needed permission from my chairman because I was only a first year resident and I didn't really have my superhero stamp yet. <laughs> so I went to speak to my chair and after my passionate uh, conversation and explanation of what I wanted to do, he looked at me and very calmly said, Dr. Pugh, if you have an interest in anatomy, innovation, and surgical education, you need to meet two people. Dr. Bob Chase at Stanford University and Dr. John Skondalakis at Emory University. And that was it. But I was so excited because I'm like, well, great, I'm from the Bay Area. Soon as I get home, I'm going to go meet with Dr. Chase and plan my takeover of medical and surgical <laughs> education. So after several meetings with Bob Chase during my visits home on holidays and uh, breaks from my surgical residency, he then gave me some very sage advice. He said, Carla, what you want to do is unusual. And it would seem prudent that you make it formal. You need to get a degree or some certificate that helps to formally marriage these two things that you want to do. Before I knew it, I was studying for the GRE in between cases in the operating room. <laughs> and I was determined to work with Bob Chase and his team and determined to come here to get the tools in the Graduate School of Education that I needed for my takeover. Needless to say, my time here was transformative. The Graduate School of Education gave me an unparalleled foundation in educational theory, the methods of qualitative research, and a strong and unwavering respect for the history of education. And this is just what the doctor ordered. It was the perfect prescription for invigorating my passion and grounding me in a sound framework to proceed with my dream of changing the face of medical and surgical education. Finally, my grand and unassuming plan 
had both substance and a strategic approach that was backed by knowledge. And it didn't take long for me to realize that education was my passion and the technology was just one of the tools that would help me achieve my goals. And everything that I have accomplished in technology and education, I owe to my time here with you. Everything. There's no question. Stanford said yes to a physician and surgeon with a crazy idea. That's a big deal. When I looked back through the announcements about this award, and Dean Stipek at the time uh, said that the progress and achievement of any realm or field pivots on the strength of the education system. It just made sense. And I thought about the education system that I trained in as a surgeon and that I am an instructor in as a surgeon. And th there's been no mistakes that I came to the right place, and I have the passion uh, to continue to do what I'm doing, and it's all because of what I learned here. The theories, the grounding, the colleagues that I have here that I continue to keep in touch with, and the new friends that I've met today, which are very exciting. I've added some folks to my research team. It, it just it feels natural, and I and and there's I know that I'm doing the right thing. It was meant to be, and the stars aligned um, in a, in a very special way. In closing, I have to say that it's great to be here and meet with old friends and new friends, and there are many of you here. And I have to pause. I mean, uh, Kelly is just. I've kept up with him on a national level, and he has a grounding that only could have been made between his marriage and what you all have provided him when he was here. And it, it was like catching up, you know, with, with an old friend who has the, a grounding and have um, taken that path that I am striving um, to walk on. So thank you for being here. I have my family here big, bold, and beautiful. I could not do anything without my family. So I love all of you, and thank you for being here. Special guests, faculty who I met when I was here on campus, both here in the School of Education, and there are faculty in the audience that found their way from the medical school here for this celebration. <laughs> thank you. There's also special guests here in Tasha and John Morgridge who, wow. I was, my husband and I were just with them last week celebrating their generosity to a professorship uh, that I received at University of Wisconsin. And I understand that they're great supporters of this institution. So they came here today after I gave them the invitation that Holly sent me. I said, I know it's probably a small chance you'd be able to make it, and they're here. I, I think this is just exciting in, in many ways that I have all of you here to, to say that this is the most meaningful honor that I have received in my career. This has once again given me permission to continue with my dream and it's allowed me to remember the very passion that brought me here in the first place. And that is a great thing. So thank you very much. dream realized. It's very nice. So uh, you're all awesome. That's very clear. But I, the rest of you are awesome too. So I don't want you to feel left out. So I want to thank you all for coming and for celebrating with us.